What we see here is one of the first narratives of scapegoating from the perspective of the scapegoat, whose innocence is maintained at all times. So René Girard wrote extensively about the Bible, often in ways that were at odds with previous standard interpretations. And his short book on the book of Job is you know, perhaps one of his most controversial and, and original readings of biblical texts. So first, just a bit of background on the book of Job. It is a, you know, well-known and, and sort of already controversial text within the Bible, which has always had a certain amount of mystery surrounding it. Um, it begins with something like a kind of folktale um, frame narrative where you have Satan essentially um, appear in heaven and um, make a kind of bet with God. So Job at this point is identified as you know the most faithful and, and pious servant of God. And Satan says, well, you know, we'll see how that goes if, you know, right now he's prosperous, he's, you know, has a, has a family, everything's going great for him, but, you know, we'll see if he remains so faithful and pious if everything goes wrong for him, right, if he loses everything. And so God basically says, okay, bet is on. Um, Job uh, uh, then is afflicted with various um, disasters. He, you know, his, his family is killed, his, um, his farms are destroyed, his home is destroyed. Um, he's afflicted with various kinds of ailments. And essentially he's left kind of scratching around in the de- dust in this abject state of, you know, covered with um, like lesions on his skin, sort of scratching away at them. And um, at this point, you know, he's, he's been reduced to nothing, right? But um, he, he's been reduced to a kind of, um, you know, com- state of complete social, a, a kind of social pariah status. Um, and at this point, a number of his friends um, come to him and sort of ask him to reflect on what he must have done wrong in order to um, attract this kind of misfortune to himself, right? And so essentially they want him to you know, accept his own, that he must have, um, you know, in some way deserved all the things that occurred to him, right? And and so, you know, much of the, the text is taken up with this dialogue with these friends who are in various ways trying to persuade him that, you know, he must have done something wrong, he needs to search his soul and essentially repent. But Job interestingly refuses to do this, right? He, he refuses to accept any culpability for what's, what's happened to him. And, you know, this, this conflict goes on for a while. Eventually, God himself appears and, you know, to make things brief. As a, so perhaps surprisingly, because, you know, in some ways, Job has, has maintained his own innocence and that what has befallen him is is completely undeserved, right? That, that there's some fundamental unfairness in the nature of the universe, right? And that, you know, God is not, and this would suggest that God is not necessarily altogether just, right? And this is part of why this text has been of interest in the modern world, because it's seen as a, a religious text that nevertheless question some of the more facile premises of religion, right? That the good are rewarded and the bad are punished and things like that, right? It, it suggests that, you know, bad things can happen to good people without there really being any meaningful explanation. And so, um, you know, long story short, God eventually arrives. And in fact, despite Job having essentially declared him, his innocence over and over again, and kind of implied that there was something unjust about God's universe, right? That, that based on the fact that this has happened to him. He um, is exonerated essentially by God, and meanwhile God tells his friends to get lost, right? And that they're, they're fools and idiots and don't understand anything at all. And so at this point, Job basically, and, and it, it returns to this kind of, after, you know, engaged in, much of the dialogue takes form in, the, is in this kind of poetic form, 
Um, it returns to this kind of folktale narrative where Job is, in fact, at the end, is rewarded. He regains much of what he's lost um, and kind of returns to something like his status quo ante. So, you know, there are many things that are are controversial and mysterious about this text that have been debated over the years by theologians, by, you know, rabbis, by um, people just in the modern world who are interested in the way this text, you know, reject, seems to reject a kind of simplistic religious vision in which God, God is fundamentally just and rewards the just and punishes the unjust. But what Girard is interested in, you know, in some ways does away with a lot of these controversies and points us in another direction. So what he observes is that, you know, the basic description of what has become of Job, right, is that he's become this complete social outcast. He's lost everything. He's, you know, reduced to this kind of grotesque and abject state of like, you know, sitting in the dirt, sort of scratching his wounds, um, you know, resembles something that we see in, in many other societies and cultures, which is this figure of essentially the scapegoat, right? The, the, the individual who is um, singled out and, you know, made to kind of bear the, and, and sort of take upon himself the sins of, and, and the, essentially the violence of the entire community. And so, you know, Girard notices that if, if you think about how, for example, the figure of the pharmacos, right, who's the scapegoat in ancient Greece is described, it's often in terms of, as this kind of grotesque, you know, physically grotesque kind of social outcast who's completely um, dispossessed, right? And, you know, based on this, Girard notices another thing, which is that, you know, if we just subtract the question of God's, you know, justice, as it's often discussed here, what we have here is essentially the other people in the community coming around and telling Job that he has to accept responsibility for his situation, right? That he has to accept that he is to blame, right? That he has to, in some way, confess. And Girard compares this to something like, you know, the sort of sh the show trials in the Soviet Union, where in some senses as if he's supposed to make some speech in which he owns up to all these sins and wrongdoings that he doesn't actually believe he's committed, but that, you know, he he's now finds himself socially obliged and pressured to admit to by his, his supposed friends, right? And so what's interesting about this is that it, it you know, again, if we, if we kind of put aside the standard theological debates about it, it shows us a social situation that we can see not only in ancient other ancient societies, but in, in modern societies, right? This, this person who's been expelled from the community, dispossessed, and has been, you know, reduced to this abject state. And, but it, but is, it is demanded of this person that they confess, right? That they somehow accept that they are deeply morally responsible in some way and that they publicly um, avow to that responsibility. And so, you know, what, what Girard argues is that what we see here in the, in this, you know, pivotal but also quite mysterious text in the Hebrew Bible is one of the first narratives of scapegoating from the perspective of the scapegoat, right? Not from the perspective of the victimizers, but ultimately from the perspective of the scapegoat whose innocence is maintained at all times and who is um, ultimately exonerated, right, by, by the concluding section of the, the text. And so, you know, for, for Girard, this is an important, you know, kind of landmark in the evolution of consciousness that he sees taking place in ancient Israel, um, through various uh, Jewish texts, and then leading to, of course, the um, Christian revelation. And, you know, his, his argument is, um, you know, th there are definitely ways that it could be debated. It, it requires us to kind of leave out certain central elements, you know, such as this kind of debate between God and Satan that, you know, is, is central to how it's, it's often interpreted. But nevertheless, it does... Um, <laughs> do uh, something quite interesting, right, in showing that the fundamental dynamics, and, and I think this relates to the way that Gerard, despite his theological and Christian commitments, is, you know, attempting to read the Bible anthropologically 
in terms of a kind of social evolution that is based on this perspectival shift where instead of seeing the um, the process of scapegoating from the perspective of those who victimize the scapegoat and thereby achieve a kind of um, re, re you know renewed coalescence of the community through this act it is seen from the perspective of a, of an innocent scapegoat who loudly and persistently proclaims his own innocence and refuses to again you know succumb to his friend's demands for this kind of confession in which he um, you know owns up to things that he doesn't believe he's actually done and of course you know it's worth adding here that this this basic phenomenon of people um, you know under immense social pressure confessing to things that they haven't actually done is a very common phenomenon in our social media world um, our cancel culture world and so the the significance of of the book of Job and Gerard's analysis is that it it shows us another kind of conclusion, right? Which is that the, the scapegoat may refuse to accept their guilt and thereby prevent or block the completion of this, this social process. So again, I think there are probably aspects of this interpretation that you know, deserve questioning because they leave out you know, parts of the text that have been regarded as um, you know, highly important previously, but nevertheless, I think it does do a remarkable job of kind of um, discovering a, a previously unremarked subtext within this biblical text. And so it's a, I think, supreme example of Girard's um, incisiveness as, a, as an interpreter of, of literary texts and of, of the biblical literature in particular. Hey, what's up? If you enjoyed this video, take a second to subscribe to this YouTube channel. We publish videos like this several times a week. And also, if you're interested in studying the work of Rene Girard on your own, we made an awesome, totally free 18-page study guide that you can download at girardcourse.com. It's expertly curated. It's in a logical sequence that's going to help you master his entire body of work at your own pace. You can go ahead and get that at girardcourse.com. All right, that's all I got for you. Over and out.